I want to start by asking everyone here tonight. We're all gathered here in this coffin. Who of you has watched 28 Days Haunted? Who of you out there even knows what the fuck we're talking about? This would be the moment you would turn the music off. You know what, Rose? That's a good point. Let me start by yes. asking those of you here gathered. Start over. I talked over you. In our... <laughs> Let me start by asking all of you here gathered with us in our coffin tonight in front of this harvest moon. Who has watched 28 Days Haunted? It's a good start. Thanks. Not yet, but it's next on my list. All right. Would we recommend it? Do we recommend people to watch it? Is this going to be a review about recommending the show, warning people for the show? What what would do? What do we want to give the people as a maybe maybe their, after we backpack. talk about it, we'll figure it out for ourselves. Okay, paranormal is hot. Paranormal is hot. Yeah, coming out of a pandemic, the uh, need for escapism supernatural explanations maybe more global acceptance for strange theories mm -hmm. niche, niche theories and apparently this whole 28 day thing is it's called the 28 day cycle apparently in like paranormal research whereas if you stay in a place for 28 days it's it's some sort of weird supernatural cycle like the chances of getting getting paranormal results increase because you spend more time there or something? Yeah, something about 28 days, which is interesting because that's like the cycle of the moon and the menstrual cycle and some things go on like 28 day cycles. So, okay. But also if you just lock yourself in a place for longer, then you also get to know the rhythm and the sound of the house. So you will also be able to distill more or less what yeah. is the normal activity in the house and what's paranormal activity in the house. So I get it because this is something I always wonder during, for example, on ghost adventures, when they just go into a house once, how can you know if a door opening yeah. is abnormal or not? How can you know that? Like when I spent the first time I spent or I sleep somewhere, it's always creaky. Yeah, you always you're always more alert. You always hear something, and you always wonder what it is. So, it makes sense. It makes sense for me the twenty eight day cycle. You should get to know the house by then. Hopefully, at the end of twenty eight days, and stop thinking that every little creak and noise is a footstep from a ghost. Exactly. So, the premise of the show is that there's three different teams. One is in Colorado, one is in North Carolina, and the other one is somewhere up north. And each team has like three or four people, and there's like a psychics, sensitives, ghost hunters. Established. Uh, established. established ghost hunters. Because, and I always professional think it's professional, ghost. right? Yeah. The, the professional ghost hunters, which to be a professional ghost hunter means you had to get paid for doing it once. And then I think you That's can the only requirement for being call, a professional ghost hunter. Call yourself a ghost hunter professionally after that, just like we're professional streamers. Exactly. Uh, so these these little teams are each uh, in a in a house in a location for 28 days, and behind uh, the scenes there is Aaron Sagers. He was here a couple of days before the the series launched. Yes, and he was talking to us about it. So you can watch that. It's on our YouTube now. Our little interview we did with Aaron. Mm -hmm. And there's Aaron and another guy, and they're kind of like behind the scenes, watching the cameras, the feeds of all of these people and what they're going through. Yes, they're kind of commenting on what's happening there. They're Sometimes they're giving extra explanations about what the, the people who are in, uh, in the locations are experiencing or the things they mentioned, the things they bring, bring up. 
I didn't get that behind the scenes dynamic. I don't really think it adds anything to the show. Okay, interesting. Interesting that you say that. Um, I might agree. I might agree. Because I did like the fact uh, that it was just... Because you also had these moments with the people on the team that were just kind of talking in a room, like a confessional room, like a reality TV show set up. Yeah. I wonder why they why they chose to do it like that. Why they chose to have these two people commenting on what's happening. I think it was an yeah. attempt of making it, giving everything that's happening on TV, give it more authority. Yeah, more weight or something. I think so, yeah. Make it look more professional, maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe the show was also doubting its own credibility a little bit. Wanting to be really serious because yeah. most ghost hunters are very serious because they want to be taken seriously. Because they feel like they have something to prove because yes. that's what they do. Literally. Trying to prove something. <laughs> Literally, yeah. More credibility. I think I think so. Like it had a little bit like the, the vibe of like crime scene investigation, just like in the office, big screens, showing showing equipment, mm -hmm. showing experience. And then it makes it makes everything look more serious. Yes. Yeah. And watching this, we're gonna give you spoiler alerts. Mm -hmm. We're gonna give you spoiler alerts. So if you don't if you still wanna watch the show and you still and you wanna go in without knowing anything about it, then you should stop watching this right now. So uh, they start out by, I think they don't know anything about the history of these houses. So it's also kind of up to them to see if they can uncover some things about the house without having been told what happened in the house. I wish they would, they would be a little bit more clear about that. I yeah. wish they would have really, in the beginning, amped up that part of the experiment. Then, because yeah. then it could also be a little bit... A little bit more gamified. Mm -hmm. Like, are they going to find out what happened in this location? Yeah. But instead, it just kind of started. And you wondered, do they know anything about this location? And then it kind of became clear that they didn't. Yeah. But it would have been way more impressive if you really know that they don't know anything about these locations. Because then the results are actually quite... Uh, um, powerful. Convincing. And so they start their investigation uh, doing stuff like I feel like if you normally watch paranormal investigation shows you're familiar with the kind of technology they use like ghost boxes uh, spirit boxes this sort of thing. They didn't use any Ouija boards. They were just like we're not going to use Ouija boards. That's so basic. So they didn't use that at all. They uh, were using like an ovulus, a spirit box, a radio sweeper sort of thing. Your basic run-of-the-mill ghost hunting equipment. Technology. Technology. And for those who don't know anything about ghost hunting, I'm sure they were like, what the hell is that? Why would that let you know if there was a ghost there? This is all founded on the belief that ghosts are made up of uh, electromagnetic Energy, which is a very Victorian. This is still an, an inher inherent belief. Uh, yeah. So they have made these devices to pick up on this this sort of thing because this is what people believe ghosts are made out of electromagnetic energy. So there's EMF readers, stuff like this that that measure this frequency, temperature things, stuff like this. All sorts of technology exists to hunt ghosts, which is just basic, basic equipment that allows some sort of gray zone in order for the spirits to manipulate it. So if you're sweeping between radio frequencies and you pick up a word, then you can interpret that as the ghost taking advantage of this, this, this object and speaking through it. Uh, EMS are real. What do you mean? Also, hello, Which one Aries. is the EMS? Is that where they get the words? Electromagnetic frequency, electromagnetic spectrum. Yes, it's real, but why would ghosts be made out of this is is the question. Why why does this belief exist and this is what ghosts are made out of? It's, it's a very Victorian belief. 
Yeah, and and, and normally the results that you're getting with these equipment, like it does show you something. Like for example, when you're when you're measuring the magnetic field in a room and it all of a sudden spikes, and this is something that happens, but then the interpretation uh for go to to say therefore it, there is a ghost, that's just something that goes too far for science. So you, you, you can use these tools and it does prove something, mm-hmm. but the conclusion, you, you can never draw the conclusion, oh, there's a dead person here. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned. Victorian, did they have equipment back then? But no, this is when the, the kind of belief that started forming about like spectral entities, this, yeah. this, this belief in what ghosts are made out of. People started to use electricity in Victorian times for the first time. It's magic. So with the technological invention, and this always has gone hand in hand with super, super superstitious beliefs. Supernatural occurrences, yeah. new, uh, new ways of looking at the world. There's too much negativ- negativity surrounding ghosts. There's good, good ones too, like Casper and Darth Vader. Um, those are fictional characters. Mm-hmm. But I do agree with you that there's a lot of negativity surrounding ghosts. And this is also something, this would be my question to to the show, actually, and to any uh, paranormal show, paranormal reality television. Uh, why do we also always only have to focus on the bad things during mm-hmm. a paranormal investigation? The trauma. It always is about trauma. Why are ghosts created with trauma? Yes, because I think if you would have a positive haunting, then I think people experience positive hauntings, but they just talk about it in a very different way. For example, if a butterfly lands on your shoulder and you think it's your grandmother, you could consider that a haunting as well. Mm -hmm. Or like that, what that guy told us in that bar once about the cardinal being his... The red bird being his oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. dad or something. His dad. Yeah. I think he thought his dad was a bird. Yeah. Yeah. It's a haunting, but it's a positive one because mm-hmm. you, it, it's, but somehow we don't want to make shows about a that. A message from beyond is a haunting, right? Do they operate on the assumption that happy ghosts have all moved on? Yes. 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 Yeah. So the only reason to stay here is because you have... You're, you're you're sad as a soul or something. Why is trauma the strongest impression? Is that just what works on living people? It kind of feels almost like uh like a, a ghost hunt or a paranormal investigation is a little bit the same thing as a as a like a criminal investigation. So a haunting indicates a crime. Yeah. It's, so it's it it feels like a very. Um, I think that's why they like each other so much. True crime and paranormal genres. Yes, yeah. and there even is a parallel parallel also with the uh, Victorian times because I think the the interest in communicating with the dead was very uh, popular in Victorian times, and at the same time the uh, detective genre in books started to emerge. Mm-hmm. So the paranormal investigation and the crime investigation of how we how we uh, like as a as a fictional genre, they kind of go hand in hand a little bit. Like also paranormal investigators are these figures who uh, for normally for moral reasons, go into a location to either help the spirits Mm -hmm. or to help the living to prevent them from being harmed by the spirit. So it always has kind of a, a, a noble motive. So you go in for the good, which probably means that there has to be an evil. Yeah. Hmm. Like the impressions are caused by people having extreme emotions and trauma is strong. So rather than ghosts being entities, so they're more like psychic photographs of events. Or I think we have to break it down even more here. Because this is already, that sentence is already full of preconceptions about the afterlife and things you've picked up from pop culture. So I think also with the stone tape theory, this is, this is really like pop cultural stuff that you've been, that you've been kind of 
picking up. So the stone tape theory where the energy is of a traumatic event is absorbed into the ground, for example. And so with this stone tape theory, they say that when you go to a haunted location or a place where something happened, the haunting itself is recreated by the environment. And that is the stone tape theory. And I think this is a lesson in magical thinking. What is magical thinking, Rose? There's definitions from a, uh, from a psycho psychology perspective. Mm -hmm. There's, there's uh, definitions from an anthropology perspective. There's definitions from uh, a biological perspective, probably even. So I guess we just have to make our pick. Pirate Cybermeow says, Magical thinking is believing that things occur due to symbols, intentions, and stuff beyond rational scientific explanations. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah, it, it's, it's believing that unrelated events have, have a causal, a causal, um, connection with each other. So for example, a bird lands on my shoulder and uh, my mother died last year on that on the same date. Yeah. Then I'm gonna link my mother being dead for a year and the bird landing on my shoulder magically together. It's a bit of a schizophrenic kind of thing also that like things are related that are not. Material things get mingled with non-material things. Yeah. So, uh, and they kind of blend into each other. Non-material so, values. Yes. Like hoarders, for example, they connect. Hoarders are like very magical thinkers where every object is there for a reason. It has a strong memory connected to it. That memory exists within that object. And once you throw that object away, you're throwing the memory out. It's the belief, which is not true. And everyone has this a little bit. Like everyone probably kept, keeps objects because they feel like this way they're going to be closer to what it actually stands for. Like you confuse uh, a symbol with the the material object. So for example, you have a you have a picture of your mom and then in looking at it, it feels like you're closer to your mom while you're actually looking at a representation of her. Mm -hmm. Or a stone has an event in it because you had you took a beautiful walk on the beach with your lover that day you found that stone. Yes. You keep it in your pocket because that way it feels like you keep that event with you. But you don't. But you do somehow. Right. And so a lot of this is involved with ghost hunting and paranormal occurrence stuff like this they're they're tied together it's very magical very magical uh interlocking belief system with ghosts yes but what you what you rarely see during a paranormal investigation is that they actually question these things there's just this only just exists exists in uh presumptions so they're not they're not they're not analyzing themselves in the paranormal investigation. Yeah. They're just going there with some kind of uh, stated agenda. Yeah, they're like, oh, when a trauma happens in a room, it goes into the walls. Like facts. They know this for yeah. a fact. They start there. Yes. When you have to start way before that and what i do think is very interesting about this show 28 days haunted is that they they admit that a paranormal investigation is a social experiment mm -hmm. it's a psychological thing also going into a haunted location going in there you bring yourself into it yes and this is this is something i really like i don't think they go far enough mm -hmm. I think they should go even far further. I would like to know more about these people that go into into the into the haunted location since they're the vessels. Yeah. They're the only thing there measuring this this paranormal activity. And it was also so over the course of these 28 days, uh they kind of have to I guess they have the agenda that they have to get to the bottom of something uh while they're there. So, of course, on like the detectives. 28th day, the shit goes down because it's the last day. Everyone expects it. 
all these tensions have been building. So like after about a week, they they have like their little spooky moments, but not a lot is really filmed. Uh, not a lot happens. It's just like kind of getting to know your roommate for the next 28 days. Yeah. And some some of these people have never met before, of course. And they're, they're starting to be like an obvious dynamic between the people, which is interesting because of course I would love to watch a reality television show where people are just in a haunted house and how that plays out. Exactly. About the social dynamics. That's the show I want to see. Yeah. yeah. Those were also for me the, the most interesting parts in the show where where the the team members started to quarrel with each other or they started to doubt each other or they they get uh, suspicious about uh, some of the some of the activity they found, whether or not maybe it was one of their team members mm-hmm. causing it. And that's where it becomes really interesting because then it's no longer about is there a ghost, but then it becomes about what happens to a person in a haunted house, mm-hmm. which I think is way more interesting because we the, why, the reason why you are fascinated with the afterlife altogether is because you are mortal. So yeah. it's it should be about us. Yeah. The living, I think. And not the dead. Because if... they are just stories. So, yeah, Paranormal Big Brother, exactly. Yeah. So after 28 days, uh, or well, actually like two weeks, things are getting kind of tense. One of the socially. teams... Socially. One of the teams has developed a very weird obsession with a ghost he calls Adelaide. Only him. No Only one him. else is talking about Adelaide. He's just only like, I think I heard Adelaide. I had a dream about Adelaide. Did you hear Adelaide? I think it's about Adelaide. Let's look for the tombstone. I gotta save Adelaide. Adelaide. They don't find a tombstone with Adelaide on it. Although if they did, that would have been very compelling, but they did not. Thank you, Wimbag. Thank you, Wimbag. Um, he just develops kind of unhealthy relationship unhealthy an unhealthy relationship unhealthy. with an, with a with a assumed with, an assumed spirit called Adelaide with a little girl ghost called Adelaide yeah and Adelaide apparently needs to be saved so for the entire rest of the show this guy is only talking about Adelaide and what she needs and like at the end he's just like visiting Adelaide's grave that is not Adelaide and it's just like, yeah, I think I set her free. Like, I just had a moment with her and I just set her free. It's just Adelaide. And we're just like, dude, kind of like. And that's what's kind the deal of. deal with Adelaide? I think it's kind of beautiful. And I wish that the show focused on that storyline a little bit more. How that person, that guy, somehow really needed to go into that haunted location to feel like a hero or to feel yes. like. He was needed and some some poor soul needed his help. So for him to feel like he he set someone free, that was that was redemption for him. Oh, well, yeah. And that that only says something about him. Yeah. And his psychology, which is often what ghosts do. They're metaphors for whatever hole we need them mm-hmm. to take. Like you're gonna get affected by the things that are already inside you. Like these 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 yeah. spirits don't they don't create sadness. They just like poke into the sadness that's already there. Yes. There is also a moment in in their in their group where one of the one of his team members is starting to get suspicious whether or not the Adelaide guy was drawing something in the mirror with his finger. With a, like a ghost message a from ghost. beyond. Yes, and then try to uh, tell the others that it was a ghost who did it. So this is interesting, but it gets more interesting. So what do they do? They ask the spirits who wrote on the mirror. And then the spirit with the ghost box or something says the name of the guy who is obsessed with Adelaide. So this guy is suspicious about his, his, like, he's like, wait a minute. I think my team member wrote on the mirror, but he does believe that it was an actual ghost who rats him out. I, I, lo- I love that. I love that little, like, weird, weird triangle. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's like the ghost told me that, that you made up a ghost. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> 
<laughs> I think that's beautiful. I love, I just love the concept of people being in a haunted house and seeing what comes out in all of them in relation to that and about themselves. And I feel like some people did, like some, a guy came out having a, a like a refined uh, psychic sense because he spent some time in um the, the deprivation, yeah, the sensory deprivation, sensory deprivation tank. tank. So people just kind of let their subconscious uh, take over in terms of like trying to find out about the history of this house and the ghosts and, and people were starting to have fights with each other because they weren't pulling their weight because some people didn't want to go to the dark side and mm -hmm. they needed them to go to the dark side to be their, their team member. Like, for example, there's this there's this uh, person called Amy, and she is a psychic sensitive kind of. They person. call her a sensitive. Yeah. She and she refuses to do anything dark, and just uh, doesn't doesn't want to do any scrying. And scrying is where you basically stare into a dark mirror and you kind of open open your mind and receive impressions and, and whatever is like a hypnotic state that you put yourself in. And she did not want to do this. But then when they were like, okay, do it with a candle then like candle flame, which is basically you stare at a candle flame and you do the same thing. And that was okay with her because that was the light. <laughs> and Rose made this really funny joke where it was like, a demon's just like, that joke's on you. I fucking love candles. <laughs> so like, why would this be any different? Of course, this is the same sort of mindset that you go in when you yeah. want to do this thing. So of course, something spooky happens when she stares into the candle flame. She gets freaked out and then doesn't want to do it anymore. And it's just... Which makes you wonder why agree to go into a haunted location to do paranormal investigation if you don't want to encounter it. Like, if finding it is the absolute no-go for you. It's like, oh my God, during my seance, we actually got something, I'm tapping out. Mm -hmm. Like, that conflict came up, I think in almost every team. Yeah. They had this conflict, like how far they were willing to go. Also, the other woman didn't want to take anything home to her kids. Yes. Psychically. Didn't want any demons to follow her home. Yeah. I'd like to see you girls on the show. You'll make it far more interesting. Those girls said, we will never get invited to the we, show. We talked about this. And the reason why we will never be invited to the show is because we would shine light upon all the things that they will not want to want to shine light upon. Yeah. Like the ghost rules. The ghost rules. The ghost rules. We would bring a sense of irony to a place that's supposed to be serious. We would make jokes that they'd have to cut it out. We would be, we would not use any equipment. <laughs> the same reason that Zach Bagans runs like a scared child when he freaks himself out at nothing. Money hungry hacks. I don't think Zach Bagans is a money hungry hack. And also I would actually use Zach Bagans as an example of a paranormal investigator who stays when yeah. shit gets spooky. Yeah, because all of these investigators, the moment the thing happened that they asked for or that they pushed for, they took off their god helmet, they ran the down god the helmet. stairs, to, yeah. they freak out, they won't do it anymore, they have, a, they have an experience and they just have to leave the room immediately. They stop at the moment something starts to happen that they can't explain anymore. Because things do happen. Like, things do happen. Things do happen. People do have experiences. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, when you watch someone have an experience, you can't say that they're not having that experience. You have to you have to believe that they are having that experience because it is happening to them. To them, it is real. Uh -huh. So I cannot say that that's not really happening because for them, it is. Just like when you hear someone's ghost story, like... I believe that you believe it. And also when you spend 28 days with that story, a story that's becoming more and more real to you, a story that you basically you become obsessed by in the in the this is this is what it is. You 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 willingly undergo an obsession with a story or with with a figure for 28 days. And then when you go into trance or when you when you use all your senses or you you go beyond the your your comfort zone you're going to experience things like this is not this is not even paranormal this is just 
like any 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 psychiatrist any psychologist would 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 agree with this yeah and, and when you go into a house expecting it to be haunted uh that's what you're gonna get how about the god helmet so i did not know about the god helmet and the god helmet basically is a vr helmet and it does like it creates some sort of a controversial Yes. It creates some sort of a wave or frequency. It messes with your brain waves with magnetics. Apparently. Giving you the sensation of s there's someone being there with you in the room. Yeah, like a presence. It, it simulates a... Well, it's not designed to do that, but apparently doing the messing with the magnets and magnetic waves in your brain gives uh, a simulation that you're not alone in the room that you have God there with you, or it's called the God helmet. So it basically simulates presence. Yeah, the, the feeling of presence, which is super creepy. Like yeah. I, I, I would be nervous putting on that helmet mm -hmm. because just that's gonna be psychologically heavy, like yeah. definitely. But this guy, Jeremy, and Jeremy calls himself a demonologist. Mm -hmm. And Jer Jeremy is a very religious man. Oh, yes. Because Jeremy is just constantly walking around with the Holy Bible in his hand. He's putting crucifixes on his partner's forehead. He is sprinkling the mirrors with his holy water. He's just like the Jesus walks with this man. Mm -hmm. uh, and he puts on the God helmet. And, um... Oh, well, first he becomes possessed by a demon. This is important, yeah. yeah. So, in this house that they are at, they find demonic activity. And this demon, uh, which they 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 eventually, like, they, they're, they're sure of this. This is a demon, this is not a ghost, it's a demon. Or do they... I think they they oh, yeah they 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 established that there's a demon and a ghost and they yeah. think that the ghost was probably also controlled by the demon when he did murdered all the murder he murdered his family so this demon in the house he gets affected by him and which basically turns him into a lazy man who only wants to sleep mm -hmm. and is a little rude is mean grumpy lazy yeah. man so this extremely righteous man of god be, uh, turns into a lazy um la a lazy son of a bitch basically and thank god he has a demon excuse because uh, otherwise that would just be jeremy yeah that's being a <laughs> yeah being jeremy a, sucks being a piece of shit but it's not jeremy it's the demon yeah he almost has a heart attack and he blames a demon and not his physical condition. Yes. 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 <laughs> he blames the demon. And then when he comes back from the hospital, because he does get a heart, he gets like a, probably it's a, a panic attack. attack. Like yeah. I know people who had panic attacks who think that their, their hearts are going to stop. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It's something that happens during a panic attack. Uh, he gets a panic attack and then he comes back from the from the hospital and his partner asks him like, oh, my God, Jeremy, what happened? And then all he says about it is they never seen that before. And then he goes straight to eating spring rolls, fried cheese sticks, fried cheese stick sticks after almost having a heart attack. Yeah. Yeah. You can't write this stuff. What I think this is this is my theory about what happened. Uh, I'm not saying there was not a demon. I'm, I'm not going to say that. But I am going to say that Jeremy, the man of God, after being ex being in this house for a couple of days and being uh, getting into a state where he can no longer suppress his ugly side, basically, because it just takes too long, takes advantage of of the mm -hmm. demon to uh, let himself go a little bit. So I'm not saying there is no demonic possession, but I definitely think that psychologically, Jeremy lets himself go a little mm -hmm. bit. And blames it on the supernatural. Yes. I also love the part where they, the team of two guys and the one woman did a seance and the two dudes did not hold hands during the <gasps> seance. Oh my because God. Because get off me, bro. 
Do not hold my hand. Yeah. Oh, and also in that in that storyline in the in that team, like at first they wanted the girl who was the sensitive to do all the like the ritual stuff because she's a woman. But then because she didn't want to do it, like this is the same girl who didn't want to scry. You only wanted to like do light work. Uh, then the guy was like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna step up and also become psychic. And at the end of the month, he's like full blown seeing like four ghosts mm -hmm. in the room. Like he's going for it. Like they were doing like the seance where they didn't hold hands. And then instead of just feeling a breeze, he went straight to there's four ghosts. Like, <laughs> went way too she far. said you're looking in the wrong place. It's right under you. Look harder. <laughs> Look deeper. And we're like, okay, he's just like a messages from beyond now. Damn, that escalated. Yeah. And this is very entertaining to watch, but also doing historical research about the past is interesting in itself because these stories did happen. They are fucking bizarre. I mean, when guys murder his entire family on Christmas Day, that's like, whoa, that is some crazy shit. So something happened. Like something happened there. And it's the and it, it is interesting to to go to get into the mystery part of that event because there's there's just facts like you know that it happened, you know that it was him, and you know when it happened. Mm -hmm. So these these are just the facts, but there and there is the the mystery part, which is the why. Mm -hmm. And we can never know this, so it is interesting to go in there and then just like ponder upon this question and then use yourself and your knowledge uh as as just an attempt to figure this one out you will never you will never get there yeah but it's just like reading a fi a fi like fiction historical fiction yeah all the poetry happens in between the facts because yeah. no one will ever know that uh, for sure and why all you can do is interpret it nothing ever happens while people are eating this is also my big point about paranormal investigations. Yeah. Um, nothing ever happens when people are eating and they have to eat three times a day. Uh, nothing ever really happened while they were sleeping. Nothing weird happened. Yeah. They didn't really catch that much on camera. I mean, they caught something falling off a shelf, which was pretty spooky. Yeah. During like when, when Jeremy, Jeremy, the demonologist confronts the demon, stuff does get crazy. Yeah. Like things fall off the shelf. Uh, but he does get pretty angry. He and does get pretty angry. I guess, I guess this is the thing that, that works for me in terms of like paranormal activity is that that emotion is so strong that I think, because I do think also that people can cause the, the, uh, experience of a yeah. ghost that they can cause uh, the energy to shift in a room because that is something we ha all have experience with when the energy shifts in a room or something or someone says something and the energy shifts. So I do think he did kind of manifest something with the anger or the vibration in his voice or, or something happened where stuff like a, literally something flew off a shelf. And that was that was pretty spooky. I liked that because it yeah. was it was such a weird moment for something to happen. Uh, but um, for the most part, like nothing was really caught on camera in terms of like paranormally. But like no. that's why I wanted them to really double down on the interpersonal relationships. Yeah. And yeah. honestly, you'd be surprised with the things that people are afraid of. I once made this art exhibition where I used uh, this this technique called the this, uh, Gansfield effect, where I basically, it was like sen sensory deprivation, where I had like a kind of notebook where people could write their notes about their experience right next to the thing. It was like a chair you would lay in, you put white noise in your headphones and, and you could like zone out. And I had like, I had made this specialized like eye thing where you put basically cut in half ping pong balls over your eyes so that you have just a white field and people were afraid mm -hmm. to do this in broad daylight it had nothing to do with ghosts it was basically just a journey into your own subconscious if you would let yourself and bl the lady that put on the exhibition refused to do it she wouldn't do it people refused to do afraid this afraid to look inside yes yeah i think this also the if being afraid of the dark 
probably also has for this girl who didn't want to didn't want to do dark stuff also didn't want to look in the mirror and i think it has something to do mm-hmm. with each other yeah like when you turn out the off the lights the focus goes inside yeah just like when you look in the mirror you look at yourself and that's what we're afraid of we're afraid of what we're gonna find when we look deeply into ourselves i think exactly and you'd be surprised of what people are really afraid of when they have to turn their reflection inwards yeah And that usually happens in the dark, I think. And the people who are, like, willing to face that are uh, artists. Mm -hmm. Like the reflection inside. I think every artist, that's 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 what you do. That's that's your career path. Like looking inside, and then coming coming up with translations from what whatever it is you find in there. And paranormal investigators, the good ones, the good ones, not the bad ones. I think the bad ones are the ones that are not willing to do that. And they are the ones that don't get any result. But this is, for me, a paranormal investigation is taking yourself to a story and then using yourself as uh, a tool to unfold it. Or something I don't know. Yeah, to like that's like, what a medium does. So therefore, I think your uh, your analogy uh, is very uh, good. That twenty eight days haunted basically is a residency, artist residency, an artist residency, <laughs> but not with artists, just with people who call themselves sensitives and paranormal investigators. But I wish they would. I wish ghost they... hunters. None of them actually called themselves paranormal investigators they called themselves hunter. ghost hunters yeah, which is a ridiculous term, and we honestly. would call ourselves paranormal investigators because we think that art and the paranormal are intertwined because we are mortal also because an art piece magical thinking is required because mm-hmm. otherwise you're looking at a dead a dead thing that has no correlation with reality. So you need to activate your magical thinking for any kind of art piece, I think, because otherwise you will not be able to see it as a relevant symbol for something. Yeah. Yeah, you also have to have a a value to an art piece. You have to have a backstory, a thing, where it stands, the context, all Mm -hmm. of these things that also are the same thing required for haunted objects. And that's why we love Zach Bagan's Haunted Museum, because he's doing the same thing. He's bringing it together in pop culture. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so we have arrived back at... Artists and mediums and sensitives somehow are not aware of each other, that they're all doing the same thing. They're all channeling something else. When you make an artwork, when you make a song, when you say you're channeling something else and like mediums and all of these people are doing the same thing, but somehow they don't see it in the same way. And when you ghost hunt, honestly, you should be more aware that you're looking for metaphors for mortality and and the context of what modern life means and how you access the afterlife is that through using technology because that's the thing that we do in this age we solve all our problems with technology but that's why we're here Sybil that's why we're here that's why the ghost maidens are here to unravel your metaphors for you and we shapeshift we're shapeshifters we are here to to give you the comparison between the paranormal and art yeah so what will we do during a paranormal investigation well funny you ask because we've done some they're on our youtube And we use our artistic abilities to interpret the influences around us. What's happening? And put them in a narrative. A narrative. Narrative continuity. That asks a question in the form of a story. Yes. Based upon real events. This became about us more than about Netflix. Um... That's good, though. But that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Because you're watching The Ghost Maidens. <laughs> Deep lore. Okay, are mommies done working now? We could have some fun. What do you want to do? Well, let's have you want some us to do fun. a crab rave? 